And if you look at milk production changes since 2001, what you will notice is that there seems to have been a decrease in milk production kind of in the eastern and particularly southeastern part of the United States, while in the western states there has been a pretty big increase in the amount of milk production. In particular, states like Idaho, California, Texas, and New Mexico have been some of the biggest uh, gainers in milk production over the past decade. And in fact, California and Idaho are two of the top four milk producing states in the country now, and we produce approximately 28% uh, of the milk, which is a pretty big chunk. And if we look at the cattle populations, one thing that you will know is in the western US, we tend to have very, very concentrated areas where the milk production is. So we have high density animal populations in these areas, and these areas tend to be semi-arid to arid climate with less than 270 millimeters average rainfall a year. And for us in southern Idaho, we very rarely get rain past May. So during our entire production season and when temperatures are hot, it's incredibly dry. And uh, the only way we're actually able to raise crops is purely through irrigation. So it's a very hot, dry climate in our area and in other areas of the West. And because of this hot, dry climate, one of the things that we do have that's unique to the Western United States is that approximately 30% of our lactating cattle are housed in dry lots. And this represents the most uh, dry lot housing in the country. So if you're ever driving around southern Idaho, you look around, you think it's a feedlot, but then the cows look funny, right? They're black and white. And it's kind of low density. So they look kind of like feedlots with milking parlors. Uh, so they generally have shade structures in them, but not always. And the cows are out pretty much 24-7, except when they're in the milking parlor year round. The other end of the spectrum, is we do have some freestall dairies where the cows are housed inside all the time. Uh, and these can be flush systems, but a lot of guys have moved from flush systems into more of a vacuum or scraping system. And then we have the hybrid, which is where we have open freeze stalls, but the cows have access to dry lots during parts of the year. Generally, once spring rolls around, temperatures warm up, the cows have access to the lots pretty much through the fall. And the emissions that we're most interested in, which you've heard probably over and over yesterday, are ammonia emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And it's because over 70% of total US ammonia emissions comes from the livestock sector. Approximately 23% of that comes from dairy. And we've heard a lot about the impact of ammonia emissions. You can have the formation of PM 2.5 particulate matter, which is a human health concern. And you can also get wet and dry deposition. And if we look at greenhouse gas emissions, the enteric and manure emissions, which would be both methane and nitrous oxide, account for approximately 3.3% of total CO2 equivalent emissions in the US. And if we just look at the ag contributions of these sources, approximately 32% comes from enteric methane and manure management. So our objectives were to measure ammonia and greenhouse gases from dry lot and open freestyle dairies in southern Idaho. We worked on three different farms. Our first farm was a small, well, what I consider to be small, a 700 cow production facility. And this was the first uh, dairy that we had done. So we tried to get seasonal um, measurements at the time we were experimenting. And we were trying to get measurements from the lot area and from the lagoon area. And what you'll notice in a lot of the dry lots is what happens, and you can see this pretty well here, is these mounds here are not the mounds that you usually see in feedlots that the cows like to hang out on. Uh, this is manure that gets scraped from the lot, and it's piled and left in the lots until it's cleaned out, usually in the fall, and sometimes in the spring. So after we spent uh, a year there, we went to a 10,000 cow milking cow production facility, which is kind of on the large end for our area. And we tried to get annual measurements from the lot area, the lagoon area, and the compost area. So again, manure tends to be scraped in the lots. It's taken out, it's windrowed and composted in this particular case, and then land applied. And all the wash water that comes from the parlors and any runoff that you might have from the lots during the wet season ends up being pumped into the wastewater storage pond. And it's kind of interesting that I did pick this image. What you'll notice is the lagoon, 
you can see the edges of it. It's a pretty big area, but it's almost completely empty. And this is one thing that does happen in our area is the lagoons tend to be pumped out in the fall. So you will have times when there's really no water in the lagoons. Then we moved to farm number three, which is an open freestall facility. And we were looking at measuring emissions from the open freestall area and from the wastewater ponds. And this particular dairy also has an anaerobic digester. It's very small right there, a little plug flow digester. So it's a flush dairy and all the uh, manure does go through the digester before it goes into the wastewater ponds. And we were, again, uh, we actually probably spent more like three years at this place trying to get a year's worth of uh, measurements. And what's nice about farm two and farm three is they're owned by the same producer. And so they're feeding the same TMR. And the one thing, the biggest difference between the farms is the two different production scenarios that we have. So if we look at ammonia and methane emissions over time, one thing that you do see is there is a diurnal pattern to emissions over a 24 hour period. They tend to be lower in the early morning as temperatures increase, wind speed increases, and animal activity increases, emissions tend to go up. So when we're doing our emissions estimates, it's very important that we capture that diurnal uh, variation. And I generally try and pick 24 hour blocks to get our daily averages. Now the same trend, while it would make sense to see that seasonally, it does and does not happen in some cases. Uh, in the spring, that's typically when we see our greatest ammonia emissions. And that is because you saw those mounds in that picture. All that manure that was collected over the winter is stockpiled in the lots. It's been very cold, so there hasn't been a lot of chemical activity going on. All of a sudden, we go from 30 degrees to 60 or 70 degrees. Everything melts. It's very wet, and you get a huge flush of ammonia from the lots during that time period. And if you've ever been in southern Idaho in the spring, you'll also notice that the wind blows like heck, which really drives uh, that uh, ammonia emissions at that time of year. In the winter, normally, it's very, very low. The lots are frozen, they're covered with snow, and you don't seem to have a lot of emissions. Unless you happen to be at the 10,000 cow dairy in February, and in that particular February, it was approximately 50 degrees, everything melted, it was very wet, and we had an extreme amount uh, of, of good flush of ammonia emissions coming at that particular time. So I guess in southern Idaho, what's winter or spring kind of depends on the year there. As the lots dry out, you tend to see a decrease in emissions, and they kind of stay a little bit lower for summer and fall, and then they tend to drop during the winter time. Uh, if you look at the freestyle dairy, on the other hand, it's pretty consistent throughout most of the year. When temperatures are very, very cold in the winter, you do see a decrease in the ammonia emissions, which is a kind of a combination of the decrease in temperature and probably increase, uh, decrease in the ventilation rate at that point because all the curtain sides are up. So maybe we're kind of missing, in some cases, some of those emissions as well. As well. Uh, so if we look at the averages, the two dry lot dairies are fairly similar. The smaller dairy was a little bit higher, but I only had seasonal data, so it could be an averaging issue or it could be a difference in feed. Um, I, was try I had tried to get their TMR formulations, but I was promised to get them and never did. So there's a chance that they could have also been uh, feeding more nitrogen at that farm. And if we look at just the housing between the freestall and the dry lot dairies, the freestall tends to be lower because a lot of that urine is washed out. These uh, barns are flushed three times a day your urine gets deposited, some of it is volatilized, but some of it also ends up in the lagoon. And I also, at that 10,000 cow open lot dairy, we were looking at the spatial distribution of ammonia. And I'd gotten questions before about, well, as the temperature is increasing, shouldn't your emissions be increasing? And in general, we would think that that's true, but you'll see when it's wet, you definitely have these hot spots in the spring. Then they come through and they clean out all the lots and you've removed a huge source of ammonia emissions. And so you tend to have very even and lower emissions in May, even though it was warmer. And then July came around and they cleaned out all the soil and replaced the soil in the pens up in front. And you could definitely see that that management practice 
decreased the amount of ammonia that was being emitted in that section of the farm, which also made the emissions a little bit lower in that month. As it starts to wet up again, you can get hot spots of emissions. And generally, when it's cold and frozen, you seem to get very low concentrations. And it's very um, spatially similar across the dairy. Rick's going to ask a question. That's, so that's concentration. Concentration of ammonia. So we, in the air, yep. Yeah. So we flooded the lots with these passive ammonia samplers, which I wouldn't use to calculate a flux, but they certainly can tell you what does the concentration of ammonia look like across the lot area. So we could see how uneven, basically, the concentrations were, which should give us an idea of how uneven the emissions might be from those areas, since it's going to be the same wind speed, same temperature, et cetera. So one thing that people do ask me a lot is, how did our data compare with the NAME study? And that was the National Air Emissions Monitoring Study, if some of you aren't familiar with that. So they had gone to a, a bunch of production facilities. This just has their dairy data. And so our three, data, our three dairies are here. These four smaller bars represent freestall dairies, kind of located in the eastern to Midwest United States, which are lower than our open lots and our open freestyle dairy, which I would expect. Uh, because you know, when you have an open lot dairy, a lot of your manure and urine is deposited on the lot, and it's immediately lost. This was an open lot that was measured in Texas, which was quite a bit higher than ours. So our data kind of falls in between you know, the freestyle dairy data that they had gotten in this one open lot. This was an open freestyle in California. Ours is quite a bit higher than that. And I'll be more than happy to talk about that after the session, if you'd like to. Uh, if we look at methane emission from the housing, we kind of see the same trend. In the spring, it tends to be very high. And those manure packs that are in there, they're very wet. You can get anaerobic conditions. And I'm speculating that this is why you see more methane emissions in the springtime versus the rest of the year. Because as the lots dry out, the methane emissions tend to go down, and they stay pretty consistent until you get uh, Winter time, uh, they were a little bit higher on this small uh, open lot dairy. We did not have a measurement for methane in the winter on the larger open lot dairy, uh, so I can't really compare that. And if we look at the freestyle dairy, it's pretty similar over time with a drop in the winter, which again, I think maybe more of a function of our measurement and the decrease in ventilation rate coming from the barns and our ability to capture some of that. I'm guessing, based on the dry matter intake of the cattle uh, and their milk production, that when you're in here, this is pretty much mostly enteric methane emissions. So this added bit that you've got from here to here, I think, is probably due to the manure pack. So uh, one thing that you really have to consider, though, is the dry matter intake of the cows. And if you look at our methane emissions on a dry matter intake basis, it's about 17 to 21 grams of methane per kilogram of DMI, which is pretty similar to that that's been reported for a variety of studies. If you look at the nitrous oxide emissions from the housing, they tend to be kind of variable uh, and pretty much low throughout the season. The ammonia emissions from the wastewater pond, the most striking thing that you'll notice is that the freestyle dairy had almost an order of magnitude greater ammonia emissions from the wastewater pond, which does make sense. As the urine and manure is flushed three times a day from the dairy barns, it ends up in the lagoon. And then that's where you end up losing a big chunk of your ammonia emissions. Whereas our other uh, two dairies had a little bit greater in the spring, starts to warm up in the summer. They're pretty uh, consistent. You get to the winter, the ponds freeze over. You have very little emissions of ammonia, except when you have some freeze thaw. So on average, our open freestyle dairy was quite a bit larger. And our two smaller open lot, well, not smaller, but the two dry lot dairies were a bit less. And methane emissions was kind of interesting. Again, the freestyle dairy, in this case, had an anaerobic digester. So you would expect there to be a pretty low amount of methane emissions from that dairy, which there were. But it was greater than our small dry lot dairy. This larger dry lot dairy, on the other hand, kind of equal emissions in spring and summer, 
but in the fall, there was a pretty big increase in the methane emissions. And at about the time that we were getting these emissions was when they were starting to pump out the lagoon at the end of the year. So I think that there's definitely an effect as you're agitating the lagoon and as you're exposing some of the sludge on the bottom that we kind of saw this spike in methane emissions. The nitrous oxide from the wastewater ponds was kind of variable over the year. Again, it, it's a pretty low uh, emission rate and there really wasn't on average that much difference between uh, the larger dry lot dairy and the open freestyle dairy. And for the small dairy, we never measured emissions of nitrous oxide that were high enough above background to really calculate a good emission rate. So one thing that we did notice on the wastewater ponds that we did not have necessarily in the housing areas was this very strong relationship between emissions and temperature. So for ammonia emissions at the large freestyle dairy, there's a very good relationship. As temperatures increasing, you get a dramatic increase in ammonia emissions. You see the same increase at the small uh, open lot dairy, but obviously the slope of this is quite a bit different, which represents the difference in the amount of nitrogen that's probably in that pond. And we see the exact same thing for methane emissions. Very dramatic increase in methane emissions over time with increases in temperature on both of the dairies but it's very important to note that you just can't use temperature to estimate emissions from lagoons because they're very different and every lagoon is different. So we also looked at the emissions from the compost yard at that one 10,000 cow dairy. The methane emissions were the greatest amount of emissions and they tended to be higher in the spring when there would have been wet material out there and it's wetter, it would go down in the summer. This particular time in June, we were out there when they were turning the compost piles, so you could see a pretty big flush of methane, ammonia, and nitrous oxide every time that they turned the piles. Uh, ammonia was the second biggest element followed by nitrous oxide. So one of the things we wanted to look at was the contribution of different production sectors on emissions from the dry lot dairy. So if you're looking to control ammonia on a dry lot dairy, you're really looking at the lots. This is where all the manure is initially deposited. This is where the urine is deposited. This is where you're going to get the greatest amount of emissions. So if you're looking to reduce ammonia emissions, you have to focus on practices that are either going to reduce the amount of N excreted from the cows or somehow manage the nitrogen that's put on the surfaces. In the spring, if we look at methane, the majority of the methane was actually coming from the cattle and the lots. But as temperatures warmed up, the majority of the methane was actually coming from the wastewater ponds. And beyond that, uh, the compost and the wastewater ponds in the spring had kind of a small contribution, and the compost tends to have a small contribution to total farm emissions throughout the year. If we look at nitrous oxide, the majority, again, is coming from the open lots. This is because that's where the nitrogen is deposited. You can get reducing conditions in the lots and you can get the evolution of nitrous oxide and smaller contributions from the compost and the wastewater ponds. It's a completely different story on the open freestyle dairy. When temperatures are warm, the majority of your ammonia and the wastewater is coming from the wastewater pond and not the housing area. But as temperatures decrease, those emissions are decreasing, which shifts the balance to the housing area. Same thing with the methane. It was approximately equal during the warmer months, but as the ponds start to freeze over, temperatures get colder, those emissions are decreasing while uh, the emission, the portion coming from the housing is increasing. So if we look at the total farm emissions, average emissions per cow per day for the two 10,000 cow dairies, we were at about 0.15 uh, kilograms per cow per day for ammonia on the dry lot dairy and 0.2 for the open freestyle dairy. And for methane, it was approximately 1.39 and 0.75. So if we do a kind of a calculated nitrogen balance, these cows are ingesting approximately 676 grams of nitrogen per day. Uh, there's about 25% of that going to the milk. Approximately 70% of that really ends up in the fecal material and the urine and we're looking at 150 to 200 grams per day being lost as ammonia emissions. And that would be approximately 22 to 30% of total ingested nitrogen lost as ammonia. 
32 to 40% of total N excreted and 54 to 72% of urinary N. So it's a pretty big chunk of the amount of N that's being ingested by the cows. And these numbers are pretty similar to what I've found in the literature. Yeah, and I didn't show this um, due to the, the uh, time frame here, but we use inverse dispersion modeling. So we have uh, 3D sonic anemometers, weather stations out there. And so we're constantly collecting the weather data, and we're using wind tracks to do the inverse dispersion modeling to get the emission estimates. I really like what you did at the end on the nitrogen balance. That's oh, thanks. Important. Yeah, I think it's important to go through and make sure that your numbers are biologically feasible. Because um, sometimes I've seen some numbers, and I, all I can think is, well, obviously the cows weren't there. Because there's no way your, your emission rates were that low with cows present that are eating. So, you know, it, it, I think it's important. And one of the things that we're doing next is actually looking at nitrogen balances on farm to kind of further validate instead of my calculated based on I know what the intake was and I kind of calculated the outputs um, to actually go on farm and do it.